<laughs> and when, uh, when, um, do I call you Sean? Uh, you can call me Sean, or you can call me Frankie. It's it's up to you. What would you prefer? Uh, well, I normally go by Frankie for the show. There you go. <laughs> okay. You're now Frankie. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Frankie Slauson Show, and as we continue our Icons of Pop Culture series, today I definitely got somebody who would definitely fulfill the shoes of what an icon is. Not only has he done over 3,400 uh, different types of commercials, but he also was the Ronald McDonald back in 1984 to 1991, and now he owns a, a vineyard in California. His name is Squire Friedel, and welcome to the show. Hey, how you doing, Frankie? I'm doing all right. How are you doing? I right. I've just uh, got a little chuckle. You said had big shoes to fill, and that's indeed what Ronald McDonald <laughs> was, or awfully big shoes. Yeah, and, and you know, it's just kind of cool to, to be able to, to find you on the internet, uh, because... Uh, I was a huge fan of Ronald McDonald back in the day uh, because I felt like back, you know, like I'm an 80s kid. I was born in 1983, so I'm only 29 right now. And I, I grew up on the on, on your commercials and stuff like that. And I always thought that Ronald McDonald had a special place in, in everybody's heart, you know, especially when you're a young kid watching them uh, to get you to go to McDonald's. Well, if you got a cholesterol problem now, don't blame me. <laughs> they do have salads there, so <laughs> monitor what you eat. Yeah. Yeah, and and how did you, uh, or how were you able to uh, audition and get the role of Ronald for so long? I was an actor in Southern California um, around the year 1977. Um, I was I was doing quite well. I was under contract to Universal Studios. They used to do all those old television shows, you know, like Adam Twelve and Ironside and the Bold Ones and Mash and Mama's Family and New and all of those shows. Uh, so every once in a while, you get a seven dollar royalty to residual check that uh, it's filing in. Uh, usually, if it's under five dollars, I don't cash them just to tick off the people in accounting. <laughs> in any event, uh, so I was doing that. Life was quite good. We built a big house on the beach in Southern California. I had a, a, a nice knack for being able to do TV commercials. I wrote a book about it in 1980. It was called Acting in Television Commercials for Fun and Profit. It's still in print. They just did the fourth edition this past year, so it's used in a lot of textbooks and as a textbook in a lot of colleges, universities, um, whatever. So I'm, I'm pleased and proud of that. It was the first book written on acting in television commercials. In any event, uh, I got home from doing a job uh, one day. We built a big beach in Sunset Beach, California, the northern tip of Orange County. And uh, I was with my wife. We just had our daughter, our only child. And I'm looking down on the beach in front of us, and there's a bunch of 14-year-olds having a good time but they were smoking dope and drinking beer. <laughs> yeah. So I looked at my wife, and I looked at our little blonde-haired, green-eyed potential beach bunny crawling around on the floor and thought maybe this wasn't the best place on the planet uh, to raise a family. So my dad lived up in the Santa Rosa area, up in the wine country of Northern California. We would often go up and visit him. And then um, we found 26 acres up here of raw land, and I thought, gee, this would be kind of fun. So we bought it, we started to build a cottage on it, and at that point, I realized, came to the realization that I was an actor, and I cannot live in Glen Ellen or Podunk, California, anywhere other than New York or L.A. Otherwise, I can't make a living. Sure. Unless I were a superstar, and I was certainly not a superstar. <laughs> uh, so um, I thought, how can I possibly do this? And I thought, if I can get one more commercial contract, because I had Toyota. I was a spokesman for Toyota for 35 years. Sure. That's got to be a steady job in the line, but in, the, uh, <laughs> in the acting business. And um, we, um, uh, so that was going quite well, but I needed one more. So I auditioned for everything. I became Carl, the good seasons vegetable guy. I was the spirit of Dawn, where I would magically appear in ladies' kitchens, telling them that if they used Dawn dishwashing detergent, their marriage just would be more fulfilling. I was Mr. Whipple's nephew. I squeezed the Charmin many a time, sat with Mrs. Olson drinking Folger's coffee. But it didn't sound like any of those were going to last, and there were a whole bunch of them. And then as fortune would have it, the guy who was the original Ronald McDonald, a fellow named King Moody, was retiring. And so I, along with 4,000 other guys in New York, Chicago, L.A., auditioned, and after about a, oh, a vetting process of about three months, uh, they picked me. So I was very fortunate. The day that we signed the contract is the day that we put our house on the beach on the market and started formulating plans uh, to build a bigger house up on top of the hill. And eventually, in about a year and a half, because Jimmy Carter was president and interest rates were enormously high, homes weren't selling. Ours did, and we moved up here lock, stock, and barrel. It was a great thing to do. Uh, we raised our daughter in a much more rural environment uh, where they actually... 
uh, in the local schools welcomed parental help and uh, she grew up to be a, a terrific kid she went to Carnegie Mellon University the oldest theater school uh, in the United States and now currently does eight shows a week in Avenue Q in Manhattan wow. so uh-huh. she is uh, quite an accomplished actor she was also she starred in the Pee Wee Herman show on Broadway oh. um, she created the role of Dory in Finding Nemo the Musical for Disney down in Orlando for about nine months she, she's really a, a very accomplished kid Jeez, I suppose you just gotta be proud because she's kind of following in your footsteps, kind of. Yeah, I think I think she has uh, a good modicum of her mother's <laughs> talent, but she has a little of my luck too. So <laughs> uh, it's worked out quite well. Susie was a dancer with the Nikolai Dance Theater uh-huh. when we got married and uh, toured all throughout the world for about ten years. It's a hard life. But, so, so was uh, that? But we're happy yeah. up here, and we live up in Glen Ellen, California. And we uh-huh. have a winery now. Started planting grapes back in 1987 when we moved here, sure. and um, or a year after we moved here. We moved here in 86. Oh. And uh, we now have a winery and um, a wine called Glen Lion. We're having a looking forward to our 27th harvest coming up. Wow. Jeez. Uh, that's Hard to believe how quickly time goes by. Yeah, no kidding. Since you started back in the what, late 80s, you figure about? Uh, yeah, well, uh, acting-wise, certainly before that. Uh, I think I did my first acting gig in 1969 professionally. Before that, worked at South Coast Repertory uh, down in Southern California for about four years. And during that, that that initial time, I was a school teacher. I taught theater in a high school uh, in Southern California in Pico Rivera called El Rancho High School, and I ran their theater, theater department for nine years. Okay. And then concurrently started acting at the same time. So everything happened, uh, as you look back in life, just exactly the way it should have. Yeah, I, I would say so. And, you know, it's... It's kind of it's kind of nice to to know that you have a uh, that you built a legacy that you have a, a, even to be able to say you've done over thirty four hundred commercials. I mean, I can't even a little imagine. over thirty four hundred. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't even imagine that. Like just for just anybody to be able to do that many commercials in, in a, a span of I don't know thirty or forty years that you've been doing this. <laughs> yep, a long time. So, what are some of your more uh, like your favorite type of commercials that you've done? The favorite ones, quite frankly, uh, were uh, Toyota because I did so many of them for so many years. And that indeed was the uh, just a huge, huge uh, financial asset in order to be able to move up here and, uh, and begin a winery. And the other one, of course, is McDonald's because that was the key to being able to um, do a lock, stock, and barrel move 400 miles north of, uh, of the mecca of acting in Los Angeles. Uh-huh. Yeah, and uh, you know one of the things that I always enjoyed <clears throat> growing up. Now it's uh, it's kind of hard to enjoy it now because not just because I'm older and everything, but I I just think that the the styles have definitely changed as far as the way McDonald's produces like the the Happy Meals and stuff like that. But I remember one of the coolest things was when they came out with the uh, Back to the Future uh, cartoon, and they did the Back to the Future promotion or whatever. Where you were Ronald McDonald for that too, weren't you? For yeah, yeah. yeah. In fact, we did. They did a movie. Uh, it was called Mac and Me. Yep. And uh, it was sort of a, oh, um, um, a little, what the, um, It's almost like an E.T. type of movie. It's Spielberg kinda. film. Yeah, uh, yeah. With What's... a little gremlin crawling around. <laughs> whatever. It was sort of a rip off of that. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I have absolutely no complaints in life other than you're getting older. Jesus. What am I going to do here? But it's, I'm looking at our poor dog down here. Uh, it's our second dog we've had up here, and she's just on her last legs. And oh, I'm thinking, uh, oh, my gosh. Oh, <laughs> I don't like this getting older part. But it seems like you kind of, you know, you have, like, one of those genuine voices that, uh, that, like, I probably have, you know, I've heard, like, I live in northern Minnesota, so I probably have heard your commercials, or, or obviously with the Ronald McDonald thing, but you ha- you seem to have a type of voice that, you know, even if uh, I was up at 3 o'clock in the morning back in, like, the 90s or whatever, and, and heard you, like, doing a voiceover for, like, a you know, Ginsu Lives or something like that, that you'd probably be the yep. voice. <laughs> it sounds like that. Or a good but wait, yeah. but wait, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll give you a, a double your offer uh, for free, but uh, you have double to pay extra. Offer, but wait, but wait, you <laughs> have to pay extra shipping. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, I did a bunch of those things too. The uh, those infomercial things and uh, just about everything that somebody would pay me for, I would do. 
And that's what, that's what this kind of sounds like, is uh, like I said, your voice just sounds like you, you could be like a, a commercial guy or a radio guy or a narrator of a, of a movie or something like that. Just, uh, just, just well, because I'm, of your voice I'm ready. That would require very little work and very little time, so if you hire me, that's fine. I'm tickled pink, too. <laughs> so, what was, so what was like some of your inspirations to get into the acting business? Well, you know, I, I sort of backdoored into it. I, I had a master's in theater. And uh, but I was much more interested in um, in working behind the scenes. Uh, I in college I stage managed and ran lights and sound. I went to undergraduate at University of Pacific in Stockton, California, and because it was a great place to hang around, there were great creative people, and uh, most of the gals that were in the theater department were the prettiest girls on campus, and there were a good percentage of the guys that were gay. And if you were relatively heterosexual, it was a wonderful place to hang around. Mm. Oh, okay. Not that much competition. Yeah. So, what do you think it would be like now if, uh, say, if you just started today, a, a young guy to say, you know, and you just started making a name for yourself? Do you think it would have been harder for you to to do that? I have no idea. You can you really can't speculate on something like that. All I can really look at it is through our daughter's eyes. Yeah. Uh, you know, she's the younger generation, and she's going through the same trials and tribulations of trying to make a living as an actor in New York City. When she graduated from uh, Carnegie Mellon, um, we, we, we talked a, a great deal, obviously, about where she was going to locate, and we convinced her that it would be a good idea to go to New York. Uh, there is still no greater credit you can put on your resume. I don't care if you are a commercial actor, a stage actor, a film actor, a television actor, or a model. But if you have on your credit that you've done a couple of Broadway shows, uh, that still is the ultimate. That's like dancing. That's like being in the Olympics. Yeah. Uh, you, you are an Olympic athlete. That is the, the ultimate. Uh, not the penultimate, but the ultimate uh, in, as far as an actor is concerned. They always had an expression even when I was a young actor, and they would say uh, the difference between a New York actor and an L.A. actor, if, they get a jo- if you get a job in New York, and they say, boy, are you talented. You get a job in L.A., and they say, boy, are you lucky. Oh, wow. And therein, therein lies a bit of the difference. I don't know if I would agree completely with that. But all my actor friends uh, that I acted with in Southern California, and in 1986 I announced that we were moving to Glen Ellen, California, and they all just, their jaws dropped and said, why would you do that? I was just on the cover of TV Guide. I was number one across in Variety Crossword Puzzle. Life was good. The career was going well. And they said, why are you giving it all up? And I said, I don't think we're going to give it all up. Most of the theatrical stuff, of course, but I didn't really care about that. I cared much more about raising a, a family in a, in a, a terrific environment. Sure. And uh, we made the move, and now they all come up and visit, and they're my age. They're old guys <laughs> and, they, and gals. And they come up and visit. And they stay in our guest house, and we sit down and have a glass of our wine. And they say, God, if I'd only thought about doing this when I was... <laughs> I, I want to say, you know, you were one of the ones that said you're being stupid. So uh, so was a winery or a good vision you wanted to do, like, in your later years? Or No, it actually just started. If we moved to Holland, I would have planted tulips, I guess. <laughs> uh, but we moved to, uh, to Glen Ellen, California. It's in the heart of Sonoma Valley, and you're surrounded by vineyards. Uh-huh. We have six acres. We're kind of remote up here. And we had a two-acre plot down below, and I thought, gee, I like my hands. Um, why don't we plant a little hobby vineyard down here? So we planted a hobby vineyard, two acres, about 1,111 vines. Not about, yeah. actually 111 vines. And learned how to grow grapes and started to make wine and just made a barrel of wine, but we sold the grapes. And the first three vintages that I made without anybody's help just sucked. Yeah. It was just terrible. And so I got some help, and I started taking some classes, and I discovered that Indeed, I had a passion for growing grapes and for making wine. So after about 10 years, we slowed down a little bit, and I had the time. Uh, we planted an upper vineyard, and we built a winery, and it's just, uh, it, it is indeed a newfound passion. Huh. It's the same Greek god, you know. In, yeah. in Greece, the god of the vineyards, the wine, poetry, inspiration, and theater was a god called Dionysus. Uh-huh. He was a terrific guy. So, People often think that Bacchus is the god yeah. of wine, but that's not true. <laughs> he was a Roman god, came in at the very end of the Greek era. If you go out tonight to a great restaurant with somebody that you love or a good friend, 
and you have a wonderful meal and you have a bottle of wine accompanying that meal, on the first three glasses of wine you are delightfully into Dionysus. Oh, That's wow. the creative part. On the fourth glass of wine, however, you will have gone to Bacchus. <laughs> no so, one has ever fallen in love over Bacchus. No one has ever fallen in lust over Dionysus. <laughs> They're very different gods. So, and if you go to Rome and, and you see the statuary or in the books, you see the great statues of Dionysus that the Romans ripped off from the Greeks. And Dionysus has a 19-year-old face, perfectly coiffed hair, six-pack for his stomach, standing in a very graceful position, almost effeminate in his nature. That's Dionysus. He's just gorgeous. Oh, wow. And then you look at Bacchus, and he's a guy about my age, but he's got a big pot belly, and he's got hair, and he's got grape juice in his hair, and he's drinking out of a big jug, and he's lusting after the young virgins. That's Bacchus. <laughs> Different god. Wow, we're, we're, we're learning stuff here even in a simple interview. There you go, you get a whole history lesson. <laughs> yeah. so, so how much does an average bottle of wine uh, cost after you, uh, after you uh, make it? Well, somebody once asked that. He said, how do you establish a price in a bottle of wine? I figured, well, if it costs me, say, $42 to make it, I just knock off 2 bucks and sell it. Oh, okay. So, so it's <laughs> kind of spend your wine. You can, go, you can go online and you can look at, uh, at our website, uh, we're in the process of updating it right now, but uh, it's there, and it's just glenlionwinery.com, G-L-E-N-L-Y-O-N, winery.com. If you need to help on spelling winery, you're probably going to the wrong website. <laughs> we, because uh, the reason why I asked that is because my dad, he kind of, he works for a local uh, off sale in town here where I live, and uh, they uh, just made a, a wine cellar f- uh, for their addition for their. Uh, store so uh, i don't know if they get your te- your wine at all or if they could or whatever no we're extremely small okay we're we're just very very small all uh, almost 90% of it is done subscription by our wine club we call our cl- our club the clan it's clan with a c not with a k so it's politically correct even in mississippi um and uh, that's how people procure the wine okay. uh, pretty much belong to the wine club. We only have one distributor left. We used to have them all over the country, but then as our wine club grew more, we would eliminate those distributors. The only one we have right now is in New York City. So is it more fun to order your wine off the menu at the 21 Club like we did last Thanksgiving and pay about four times what they gave you for it? The answer is yeah, it is. It's okay. kind of cool. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and I suppose, you know, like, like uh, well, you got different flavors, too, or, or different assortments. Or do you just have one certain kind that you... No, no, we make, we make uh, six different wines. We make... Uh, the only thing that we grow here is red. Uh, we grow Syrah and Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, two noble red varieties. Um, we grow those two, and from those, uh, we make uh, a couple of additional wines. So there's four uh, reds, basically, that we make out of that. We also procure... Uh, Viognier from a local vineyard. It's a French Rhone variety, and we also procure uh, Chardonnay from over in Sonoma Coast. From another, we give both those people vineyard designations, and then we make a rosé out of Syrah. We have true Syrah. We have a Syrah and a Cabernet Sauvignon blend. I call Squire's Toast. Okay, kind of a funny label. <laughs> yeah. And then we uh, do, we do port on the back end, make it out of Syrah. So, so excuse me, uh, busy, okay. um, very busy. So, uh, like, uh, where do you see the uh, wine industry going? Like, for what you're, what, what's what you're doing? Where do you see it going in the future? Are you pa- going to pass it down well, to your daughter? That's a great question, <laughs> uh, Frankie. It's a great question. The, you know, when I I graduated from high school in 1960. Yep. And in 1960, 90 percent of all of the grapes grown in California went to cheap, fortified wine like Thunderbird. Uh huh. Ninety percent. There were only a few wineries uh, in and around California because we were still recovering from Prohibition. Prohibition was repealed ten years before I was born. Sure. And uh, we still, when I grew up, there was never once on our dinner table a bottle of wine. Not once. Huh. Uh, Susie introduced me, my wife introduced me to wine uh, when I was about 31 years old in New York City. She yeah. ordered a bottle of wine, and it was a French Bordeaux, and it changed my life. Because I'd never tasted anything before that. When you ate, you just ate because you were hungry. Um, Blue-collar family. And that really changed the course of things. And then we started uh, dating, and then seriously, and then we got married in 1977. Um, We started searching out wine in earnest. My dad lived up here. 
1970, which you know maybe sounds like a long time ago to you because you were born in 81. Uh, um, isn't that true? 81? A- a- 83, actually. 83, okay. <laughs> so you're before I became Ronald McDonald. Yeah. Um, in, ni- in 1970, there were only 200 wineries in the United States. Wow. Before Prohibition, there were 2,500 in California. Jeez. So uh, we have come a long way. So we went from zero wine consumption in this nation when Prohibition ended, zero, uh, and right now we're the largest wine consuming nation on the planet. Huh. Wow. That's... So uh, even people in, you know, there are areas in, the, in these United States um, that still are relatively dry. Oh, uh, yeah. There's still antiquated shipping laws in a handful of states like Utah and Massachusetts that are, that are just in the dark ages. Um, and it shouldn't be that way. But we're, we've come a long way. When we first started making wine, there, I think there were only 18 states that we could ship to. Uh-huh. And now we ship just about everywhere. And that's exciting. Um, people are, are enjoying and discovering the great pleasures that go along with wine. Wine for a long time was thought to be kind of a snooty thing, and nobody could pronounce Chateauneuf du Pop or <laughs> Viognier or uh, Romani Conti. Or, uh-huh. Nobody knew what those things were, and they always sounded so pretentious. Orson Welles used to do the Paul Masson ads, no wine before its time. <laughs> and it was just so silly, because wine is just a, an everyday beverage that you can enjoy. Uh, it, it, it settles your stomach. It uh, keeps the bad things uh, in food or in water at a bay. You know, wine, they've been making wine for 8,000 years. Yep. And uh, of those 8,000 years, uh, 7,600 of those years, uh, wine was not ever thought to be something that was a tasty beverage that went well with a steak on Friday night. Huh. They drank wine because it was safe to drink. Nothing else was, okay. except for beer or, uh, obviously, hard liquor. Yeah. Because the alcohol, and it kills all the bad stuff. Huh. If you drink wine three meals a day, uh, you're never going to get salmonella or dysentery or E. coli poisoning or things like that. So if you live in those third world countries, you want to have a solution to all the disease and famine in the third world countries, just ship them down cases of unsold two-buck chuck. <laughs> so, literally, uh, could, so literally, the old saying that if you drink a, a, bo- a glass of wine a day... You could live a long time, probably. Not huh? can you will. You will live okay. a lot longer if you drink two glasses of uh, of red, particularly red wine, because it has more benefits than even white. Um, it has a thing called resveratrol in there, which um, offsets cancer. It offsets heart disease. You know, they did a thing called the French paradox uh, a long time ago um, on, on sixty minutes and. I just drove wine sales uh, crazy because people started to realize, gee, here's something I can do for my body that makes me feel better, uh, and it also makes me live longer. So one or two glasses of wine also will yeah. actually improve an otherwise grumpy disposition. So, uh, so can you say that you're like at your age of seventy? Uh, I believe that's your right age, right? Yes. That you're probably in probably the best the best health you could possibly be in compared to like a twenty year old. Because of what you do? Yeah. I, well, I don't know about a 20-year-old, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I can certainly arm wrestle and race around the block anybody else I know that's 70 years old. <laughs> well, unless they drink two glasses of wine a day, then. Because I've met, okay. met some older people before and, and who are, like, you know, in their 60s and 70s who are all crippled up and in wheelchairs and nursing homes and stuff like that. And it's just kind of sad to see that happen. But if there's a solution like wine, well, why don't more people try it? <laughs> Yeah, and if you even if you drink a little bit of wine and you are crippled up and you happen to be starting late, it'll make you feel a little bit better about being crippled up. Yeah, you know? yeah, what that's for heck? sure. Well, hey, I, I tell you what, I, I definitely appreciate having you on, and I don't want to hold you up for too long, but uh, I, this has been definitely an honor. Uh, you seem like a really uh, down to earth guy, and that's why that's why I wanted uh, to do this interview with you. Not just so much just because of the McDonald thing, but just because uh, I believe you are one of those guys who would. Uh, uh, be a, a, an icon of pop culture. Even if people don't remember you, but I'm sure a lot do. So you know. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been called an icon, so I appreciate that. <laughs> hey, no problem. You know, I'm happy to do it. My, uh, my wife has called me other things, but never an icon. <laughs> well, you're an icon <laughs> over here. <laughs> All right, it was man. Great talking to yeah, you. Yeah, hey, you have a good one, and uh, I'll definitely uh, put the website down below so people can check you out if they want to. 
good deal. Please do. All right. Have a good one, man. All See right, you later. You Bye. Take care. And that was Squire <laughs> Fr- Squire Friedel, a man who, uh, like he said, heard the interview. Uh, is a uh, well, I would definitely see a definitely call an icon of pop culture. Maybe some people probably would, but I I definitely would because he he's a hardworking man, even at the age of seventy, who now uh, has been doing a, a vineyard for so long, but has you know a legendary status as uh, an actor as well, and, and and being Ronald McDonald. I mean that's I mean if, I think once you get the role as Ronald McDonald, that should if you do anything else, or if you don't do anything else, being Ronald McDonald uh, should be your your the biggest claim to fame, I'd say. But uh, it's just cool to talk to a guy like that who is down to earth, and just pretty much everybody I've talked to is a, a down to earth type of person. So, uh, well, like I say, it, uh, this has been Frankie Slauson and uh, Frankie Slauson shows Frankie's icons of pop culture series as we continue. And uh, let me know what you think about these interviews, and who who would you like me to try to find if I could? That would be somewhat, uh, you know, not you know. Obviously not Justin Bieber or anybody like that, but somebody who you think would be easy for me to get. Somebody that I you know that I'd probably be able to get. That would you would consider an icon of pop culture, or somewhere close to it anyway. Uh, let me know, and uh, we'll talk to you later as uh, Frankie's Icons of Pop Culture series continues all summer long on the Frankie Slauson Show on YouTube.com. <laughs>